So our next speaker is Matei Zaharia, who is the CTO and co-founder of Databricks, obviously one of the uh, tool vendors that's uh, making a lot of uh, waves in the industry right now. Uh, and he's going to talk about data mesh and lake houses. So for those unfamiliar with the term, I'm sure Matei will go into it much more articulately than I can, but lake houses combine traditional data warehouses and, and data lakes to allow you to have a single platform that can bring you some of the high performance query processing to, that you might find in traditional warehouses and governance with the large scale and open formats that you might find in, in data lakes, uh, allowing you not to have to manage them separately. And there's some new open source initiatives, one which Matei is involved in uh, called Delta Sharing that he's gonna walk us through that can directly support data mesh architects, uh, architectures, not just within the same technology platform, but in a way that's portable, for example, across uh, cloud platforms. Uh, so Matei will, will walk us through his involvement in the Delta Lake open source uh, and how data mesh and lake health systems can combine to simplify data architectures. So Matei, please take it away. Hi everyone, I'm excited to talk about how data mesh and lake house, two emerging trends in data management, can work together to bring modern architecture to all data and workloads. So at Databricks, we work a lot on data management systems, query engines, and so on. And we talk to a lot of enterprise users about what problems they, you know, they have working with data. And what we found is that for the individual users, the top challenges doing things with data often um, are related to the data itself. In particular, there are three of them. First, there's access. Can I even get to this data in the platforms I use, such as my favorite uh, BI tool or you know, maybe my favorite data science environment to do my data science and so on? Obviously, without that, I can't do anything with it. Second one is reliability. Is the data correct and high quality? Otherwise, it's not useful. And the third one is timeliness. Is the data fresh or is it you know, weeks and months old where I can't reason about what is happening today? And we're not the only uh, people to, to, to find out, uh, you know, to see these problems. Actually, a lot of the industry um, agrees on them. For example, Fivetran ran a survey of data analysts, and they found that 60% of data analysts reported quality as their top challenge, and 86% of them had to use stale data, uh, with 40% using data that's more than two months old. And also 90% of them had regularly unreliable data sources. And the same is true in the data science world. Kaggle ran a survey of data scientists and the top challenges for them are analyzing, you know, understanding their data and then building infrastructure to produce it for them. So delivering high quality, timely data is definitely difficult. It, it's, you know, it's also different in each business. Um, but one thing I wanna talk about is that it is partly a problem of our own making and that we can then help address. In particular, there are two sources of data challenges that we can address. First is organizational. Uh, central teams and processes are often a bottleneck for uh, delivering results with data. And this is where the data mesh architecture that you know, this conference has been about comes in and can help address these and help uh, you know, companies organize the way they work with data a lot better. But I also wanna call out that there are some technical reasons why working with data is sort of unnecessarily difficult today. And this ha has to do with how we've been designing data management systems for the past few decades. And this is because data warehouse systems, kind of the premier way that organizations, you know, manage and, and share data were designed, uh, you know, in the 1980s, long time ago, when, when they could assume that they can control, you know, the, an entire pool of data and that they're the only system that, you know, that, that accesses the data. And this means they're designed around proprietary storage formats and, and limited, limited interfaces for actually querying the data. And this limits access to other tools or definitely to other teams and organizations that may want to use a different system to, to access the same data. So this is where Lakehouse systems come in. Lakehouse is a new kind of data management system design that tries to build data warehousing capabilities directly on open data formats, which are widely usable by a wide range of tools, the kind of formats you would see in data lakes. And these two things work extremely well together. Data mesh benefits from you know, you know, the, the data in each domain being as widely shareable and usable as possible. And Lakehouse allows you know, many different kinds of engines and, and processing tools and so on to work against the same set of data. And so it makes a lot of sense to combine these two. 
So in this talk, I'll, I'll talk um, in more detail about what lake house systems are, how they work, how they actually you know, achieve all these, these, these capabilities, and then how you can use them in data mesh. So let's start with a history of data management systems to kind of motivate and explain Lakehouse. Uh, modern kind of uh, analytical data management started in the 1980s with data warehouse systems. At the time, companies were deploying more and more applications, operational applications that use data, like let's say an airline's booking system, and they wanted to collect data from all of these and analyze it together. And so vendors developed this new kind of system, an analytical data warehouse that could ingest from lots of sources and then could let you organize your data and, um, and um, uh, set it up for analysis. And these had very powerful management features in there like transactions, um, index schemas and so on, as well as uh, features that improve performance such as indexes that would allow you know, thousands of users to then query the data and build things with it. And these are a very successful system design you know, still being used today. But about a decade ago, data warehouses started to have some new challenges. First of all, they couldn't support the fast growing amounts of unstructured and semi-structured data in enterprises. Today, enterprises have not just tables with, with transactions, but also things like time series, logs, images, text documents, and so on that they wanna analyze and, and perhaps share within the company. Um, data warehouses also had a high cost to store large data sets. They're designed to store tables and they were designed you know, at a time where much of the data was just generated by humans doing things. So there wasn't that much data coming in per day. But with these machine generated data sources, things like sensors, you can have much higher volumes of data and the costs could often become extremely large of, of just running them in that system. And finally, data warehouses were designed to offer this limited but very fast um, uh, kind of SQL based interface to applications. So they couldn't support other emerging kinds of applications like data science and machine learning. Today, virtually all of the Fortune 500 companies you know, use machine learning and production, uh, for example, in some way, and you can't run that easily against a data warehouse. So this led to the rise of a second kind of data management system used alongside the data warehouse called the data lake. And the data lake is primarily focused on low cost storage for any kind of data. So basically these will, these will store all of our data. They usually have a file system interface where you can put in data in any format, it's just a file. And examples of these include Amazon S3, Hadoop file system, and many others. And another interesting thing with data lakes is that the, the tech community standardized around open formats for the data in there. So for example, Apache Parquet, and these formats as a result, like once you load the data into one of them, they're directly accessible in a wide range of computing engines. In particular, a lot of the modern machine learning and data science stack builds on these open formats. So once you have the data in there, you've got all these systems that know how to read Parquet, write it, exchange data through it, and you know, virtually every custom algorithm that someone is writing to to, to work with data at scale today, like every new system someone built like Spark or Flink or whatever knows how to read Parquet and so you can run them on your data. So that's a positive aspect. Um, but data lakes alone don't have all the management and performance features of a warehouse. So for the data that you wanna curate and open up to lots of business users, you still have ETL jobs that load that subset into you know, one or more warehouses and then you run those on top. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, what we find is, you know, more than 90% of data in most enterprises actually lands in a data lake first and, you know, is in a data lake and then subsets are curated and put into the warehouse. So if you look at this at a high level, it might seem that things are good. We now have cheap storage for any kind of data and we still have all the powerful stuff that data warehouses could do that they've been doing since the 80s for our business users. So what's wrong? So the problem is that this two-tier architecture itself introduces a lot of challenges. It's cheap to store all the data, but it's a complex architecture where a lot of things can go on. So first of all, data reliability suffers. You've got multiple storage systems storing the same data, but they have slightly different semantics, maybe different data types, maybe different versions of the SQL language that, uh, you know, and if these differences can cause problems. And you've also got many more ETL jobs that are just moving data between these two systems, and those can introduce, you know, quality problems as well, if there's anything wrong. 
So this actually leads to a lot of quality issues that then the end users of the data experience. Second problem is, is lack of timeliness. You've got these extra steps that data has to go through before it even lands in the data warehouse and can be used by most business users. And that's what introduces these delays of weeks or even months for someone seeing the data that they need. And finally, you've got high costs because you're duplicating some of your data and you're running all these pipelines continuously that just copy stuff back and forth. So these are the problems that motivate Lakehouse. So Lakehouse um, instead tries to you know, eliminate the need for two tiers and just implement these data warehouse management and performance features directly on top of low cost uh, data lake storage in these open formats. Um, and um, so if basically you get a picture like what's shown here, you ingest your data, it, you can store it in you know, low cost data lake like S3, you use these open formats. And on top of that, instead of just exposing a collection of files to all the applications and saying, you know, go ahead and manage that, the Lakehouse has this management and performance layer that I'll talk about that implements you know, richer data management features. And on top of that, you've got two interfaces, SQL for everything that speaks SQL, and also direct access to these underlying files for applications like data science and machine learning that already know how to read them and can get very high performance doing that. So that's kind of the vision of Lakehouse. Obviously, it would be really nice if, if, it, if it could work. But the question is, can we actually get state-of-the-art performance and governance features that we need and so on with this design? And um, you know, my, my view is that we can. And I want to talk about some of the work that's been happening in the open source community and in you know, various vendors around Lakehouse to make all this possible. So in particular, there are three key technologies enabling Lakehouse. The first is metadata layers on data lakes. These implement that management layer I showed before that adds features like transactions, versioning, governance, and so on, on top of a collection of you know, data lake files. An example of that is Delta Lake, an open source project that we launched at Databricks, but there are quite a few others you know, following the same pattern as well. Second is new query engine designs that are getting great SQL performance on these open formats. So it turns out you don't actually need to, um, you know, to, 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 to own all the data in the, uh, in the query engine and limit anything else from touching it in order to get great performance. You can actually get state-of-the-art performance on open formats, and I'll talk about how. Um, and then the sharing and governance features, these are kind of the newest element of Lakehouse that enable uh, doing that with this data and open formats. And one of the cool things in Lakehouse is that these are actually open and can also work across products. So you can share data with someone running a different query engine than you. So let's start with the metadata layers. Um, so the idea here is at, at a high level is, is pretty simple. Um, you've got your data lake that's a collection of files, but then you have this layer sitting on top that implements a higher level concept, such as tables and, and views and, and so on. Um, and applications talk to, to the metadata layer to see that. So for example, the metadata layer will track which files, which parquet files in this open format are part of a specific table version. And when an application talks to it, it can, it can get that list of files and it can get uh, credentials to read those individual files if it has access. And the metadata layer can then implement a whole bunch of features, for example, acid transactions where you change the files that are part of a table all at once or cloning zero copy clone where like two tables are pointing to the same file and so on or of course governance and access control features. And so you've got these uh, management features in the metadata layer but clients can still access these files in open formats to read the bulk of the data once they have permission. So this big ecosystem of existing applications can still work with it. And there are a bunch of examples of this. We developed Delta Lake at Databricks. Um, Uber, for example, runs all its data infrastructure on a system called Apache Hootie that they developed that works in a similar way. Um, there's also Apache Hive Asset, and there are others that are now being used to manage you know, huge volumes of data. So these allow you to build a lot of rich features. For example, in Delta Lake um, itself, in the open source project, we support asset transactions, time travel to old versions, uh, zero copy clone, check constraints, and, and, and table history. Um, and all of these uh, you know, can, can, can be used you know, basically by any engine that, that talks uh, to Delta Lake. Um, so basically, all these features that previously required like a you know, 
moving all the data into a proprietary format, you can now get for like data and these open formats in the lake house. And we've also seen these very rapidly adopted. Uh, Delta Lake, for example, is used at more than 3,000 uh, companies among our customers alone to manage exabytes of data, which is bigger than basically every commercial data warehouse uh, out there in terms of total data. And it has very broad industry support uh, where all these tools that work with data warehouses are, are building connectors to work with these uh, open uh, systems for managing large volumes of data. So that's the data management layer that gives you management features, but to, to make this a great platform for use in a, in a company, you also need performance. And that's why that's where like Lakehouse specific uh, query engine designs come in. So it might seem, you know, at first, if, if you think about Lakehouse, it might seem that if your query engine can't directly control the storage format and, you know, dictate exactly which data goes in and so on, it won't be able to get the best performance. But it actually turns out that you can get excellent performance on these. The open source formats themselves are, uh, are quite good to begin with. And there are also a lot of optimizations you can build alongside them in the metadata layer that then lead to, to excellent SQL performance. So just as an example, uh, there's often a subset of data that's hot and frequently queried, and most data warehouses will cache that in a very efficient uh, form. And you can do the same thing with Lakehouse. So all the hot data can still get the you know, same performance a warehouse would. Uh, for other data, you can have auxiliary data structures like statistics and indexes that sit alongside the parquet files and so on and let you get great performance. You can manage the data layout inside files as well to minimize IO, and you can manage the way that these um, engines execute on the CPU to use vector, vector instructions and other features to get great performance. So a bunch of vendors have been building engines to do this. And as an example at Databricks, we've built Photon, which is a, a, a new query engine designed specifically for Parquet and Delta formats in this open environment. And the results of combining these are great. We're actually getting best in class performance even on pure data warehousing workloads. Last year, for example, we submitted an entry to TPCDS, an audited benchmark that's organized by the data warehouse industry with, you know, with a bunch of uh, queries and, and, and data types that, that, that you can analyze. And we set a world record for performance on that using you know, open data in, uh, in Delta Lake format. Um, and we also had a third party compare the performance with Snowflake as an example you know, of a leading data warehouse. And we actually turned out to run about 2.5 times faster on the same kind of hardware environment and 12 times lower cost. Partly this is because um, the Photon engine is also designed to be able to use spot instances in a, in a cloud environment. Um, so you can basically get you know, state of the art performance on data warehousing workloads without having to move them into a proprietary format first. And then the third pillar uh, that's enabling Lakehouse to be you know, you know, a widely used uh, data management technology is sharing and governance features. And again, the, the community is developing these in an open way that really takes advantage of what's possible with, uh, with open data and, and with data lakes. So let's talk about sharing first. So how should you share data between organizations, say, as you build your data mesh? Um, the answer from data warehouse vendors has been, you know, as long as you get everyone to use the same data warehouse product, we can share data between instances of that, say, in the same cloud region, because we have sharing features built in. So that's really nice. Those are powerful features, but it's pretty painful to use at scale. What if part of your company has already standardized on another data warehouse? So you're going to ask everyone to migrate? Or what if you do you know, mergers or acquisitions and then parts of the business are running something else? So it's not really a, a, a complete um, answer. Um, the Lakehouse answer to this instead has been to build an open protocol that can work across products. You know, maybe part of your org is using Databricks, part of it is using Presto or Athena or like other query processing engine. That's okay. They can they should still be able to share data with each other, and it's possible because these systems all build on these open formats. So in Lakehouse, for example, in in, in Delta Lake, we've developed a protocol called Delta Sharing. And the way it works is you've got uh, uh, your data table, you set up sharing in a service for, uh, and, and you set up you know, users and permissions, and then they can connect to it using any tool that understands the sharing protocol. Doesn't have to be Databricks, for example. So for instance, there are connectors 
for delta sharing from Power BI, Spark, Pandas, and other systems that users can use to connect to it directly, even if they're not running the same platform as the data provider. And it means once you publish data, you know, very wide range of users can use it without having to deploy a whole data warehouse to do that. We've seen very fast update uh, of this among our customers. It's in preview, but it's already being used to share petabytes of data per week between different organizations. The similar kind of story also applies to governance. So with governance in a data lake, it's traditionally been hard to do it because data lakes were these file systems like S3, ADLS that have you know, a, a specific interface to them. It's complex to manage and it also, everything's at the file level. So you can do fine grained policies. But in lake house systems, because you have this management layer on top of the data lake, you can actually bring very standard interfaces for managing um, access control and apply them to these you know, exabytes of data that, that, that exist in there. So for example, in the catalog we have in Databricks called Unity Catalog, all the management is done using SQL grants. So the same way you would set up permissions in, you know, in MySQL or, uh, or Postgres, you can set them up on these massive uh, kind of uh, tables in, in data lakes, and you can bring in users and, and give them access to it. And other vendors are building similar things in their you know, lake house products. So it's a very standard way uh, to manage this data. So to put all these things together, lakehouse systems combine the benefits of data warehouses and lakes. Historically, these have been different systems, but there isn't a strong technical reason for them to be different. And so you can get management features, high performance, but also open interfaces and low cost. And the really cool thing is that by having this single tier, you actually simplify data architecture for the company overall, and you, you improve access, reliability, and timeliness for all users. They can all safely query basically all the data coming in the organization. As soon as it arrives, they don't need to wait for all these steps to move the data between systems. So it, it actually makes everyone's life simpler as well. So that's Lakehouse systems. Now, how do they fit together with data mesh? How, how should you think of them together? Well, to build a successful data mesh, you'll probably want to support a few things. You'll want to support diverse data, tables, text, audio, time series, and so on, because companies today collect diverse data and you know, all of this, these data types face the same problems that, you know, that motivate data mesh. You'll also want to support diverse engines. You'll have users in SQL, but maybe multiple SQL and you know systems in different parts of your org. And you'll also have users using Spark, TensorFlow, lots of other tools that work on data. And of course, the data mesh, you know, any data product you build needs to serve as many users as, as possible to succeed. Uh, you'll want flexible sharing, and you'll also want catalog and governance tools that work for all these types of data. So Lakehouse systems with the latest things that are happening in them are actually a great fit for all these requirements. You get the open interfaces and the massive scale that lets you support the diverse data and engines, and you also get these rich management features. So when you look at the overall picture of a data mesh, you can actually see at the top um, in, 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 the, in the original blog post on it that global governance and open standards and interoperability are some of the main things that, that you want for it to succeed. And so when you think about how to implement each of these domains, we think that Lakehouse is actually a great choice as the technology to build each of the domains on and then to share stuff between them. So that's my main message. Data Mesh works really great with Lakehouse. I think they're kind of made for each other and I'm excited to see what the community does with both of them together. Thanks.